Hey there, today on Big Al Books I'm going to be talking about the books that I read in March and there are only five of them and they are all gigantic because I'm sure if you've been following my channel for the past few weeks you probably know that I've been co-hosting and avidly participating in the March of the Mammoths readathon. So originally, when I was trying to plan how I wanted this video to be structured today, I was thinking that it could be fun to rank the mammoths and to go in some kind of least favorite to favorite order, but that became pretty difficult because I actually enjoyed all of these books. So that was kind of hard. There was no like clear loser of the readathon. And I also realized that each of these books are really their own unique kind of beast. Like they are very different from each other and they're all trying to achieve different kind of goals and they're written in completely different styles. So that didn't really seem fair. But I still thought it would be fun to have some kind of competitive edge to this video. So I came up with a mammoth ranking point system to try to be a little bit more objective with how I'm going to rank these mammoths. So I came up with a 15 point scale and there are three different categories. Each of them are worth five stars each. So my first category that I wanted to take into consideration was enjoyability. So basically, was it a fun reading experience? Did I have a good time? Was I excited to pick up the book? How much pleasure did I get from the experience. My second category is endurance. So one of the reasons why I love reading long books is because it is kind of difficult and it takes a lot of stamina to complete these books. You can't just kind of quickly brush through them and go on to the next thing. You really have to grapple and really work your way through the experience of reading and processing these texts. So for the endurance category, I really wanted to think about the difficulty of each book, how much effort did it take for me to read them, and did they improve my reading stamina in any kind of way. And then my third category will award points for longevity. Basically, we are talking about the lasting impact that I think this book is going to have on me. Now, that's difficult to say right now because most of these I've just finished <laughs> within the past few days, so I don't really know how it will affect me later down the line. But right now, I'm just trying to think about the staying power that the book had, how much of an impression it left on me, um, did I have a deep connection to this book, did it give me lots to think about, how memorable do I think this reading experience will end up being. So those are my three categories, like I said, 15 points awarded for each book, and then at the end we can see objectively <laughs> which mammoth I think was really my favorite. So I'm going to talk about them in the order that I finished reading them. So my first mammoth that I have completed is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, and I read the translation from the French by Robin Buss. So The Count of Monte Cristo was the first mammoth that I finished, but it was also by far my longest mammoth of the challenge, including the footnotes. This comes in at around 1,276 pages, so it is a pretty hefty beast to get through. And I've already talked about this one a little bit in one of my mammoth update videos, but essentially this is just such an epic revenge tale and I can truly understand why this book is a classic and why so many readers have loved and enjoyed this one throughout the years. It truly really is a lot of fun. So if we're going through my mammoth ranking system, for the first category of enjoyability, I would have to give The Count of Monte Cristo an easy five-star rating for that category because I truly did have a lot of fun reading this one. It was also really cool getting to read this for the first time without really knowing much of anything about the plot. I had never read an abridged version when I was younger. I'd never seen a film adaptation. There were so many details about the plot and the characters that I just had no idea about going in. So the plot was definitely thrilling for me, especially as it kind of like sped up once the story gets going into motion. So I had a lot of fun not knowing what was going to happen and feeling the suspense. There were definitely a few moments where my jaw was dropping and I was kind of shook with what was happening. So I definitely did have a blast reading this one. The characters are just very dramatic, very extra, but that makes them pretty fun to follow, especially the Count of Monte Cristo himself. Like he takes the art of getting revenge to this completely new level. You know, I think it's really hard to sustain a revenge tale for this amount of length because you know exactly what he wants to do, but you have to wait through so much to try to see how his revenge is going to be fulfilled. So it was pretty fun to follow that plot. 
For the second category regarding endurance, I gave this book two stars because nothing in the text seemed particularly challenging and because I was having so much fun while I was reading it, it wasn't really all of that difficult to get through the text. Like, yes, it is very long and there are a few moments where the plot kind of slows down and it does feel a little bit dry. Scenes with Albert. Ugh. Anyway, um, Overall, though, there wasn't anything that really presented much of a challenge with this book. This is definitely a book where the plot is at the forefront. You can tell that it was serialized, something that would want to keep the readers coming back to the story and turning the pages. So I didn't really feel like there was any kind of particular challenge with finishing this or with the language itself. Then for my final category of longevity, I gave this book a three out of five stars. So the good things about this book is that this is such like an iconic classic, and it feels really good to have this one under my belt. I'm glad that I know the story now. This is something that gets referenced a lot, and I'm glad to be like in the know with this book now. However, this book lost some longevity points because I didn't feel like it had all that much complexity to the text. It just seemed a little bit obvious what the characters were doing, what their motivations were, and how they would interact with one another. So I feel like this book just didn't have enough of that depth that I look for in a mammoth. So it's not one that I will be thinking about the themes and reflecting on them very much. Like it was one that like I had fun with the story, it was a good time, but it's not really a book that has truly changed my perspective in any kind of meaningful way. However, I did end up watching a film adaptation of this, the one from like 2002 or something, and that did make me appreciate the book a lot more because that film adaptation was trash and they changed so many events from the book and made them worse so watching that also like made me feel so much more appreciation for what this story does and how it's told. The second mammoth that I finished reading was The Guermont Way by Marcel Proust. This is volume three in the In Search of Lost Time series and I read the translation that is by C.K. Scott Motcrief and Terence Kilmarden which was later revised by DJ Enright. That is a mouthful of translators for you. So this one was my shortest mammoth that I read. It is only 820 pages. However, you know, keep in mind that this is only volume three of a much greater series that when I finish In Search of Lost Time, that will by far be the longest novel that I've ever read. So this one is kind of hard to rank and consider on its own because it is kind of like the middle volume of like this much larger project. Basically, In Search of Lost Time is following this narrator who is looking back on his life and we seem to kind of be going in this chronological order. So we started off with his childhood, then we got into some turbulent adolescent years, and now we're following our narrator as he's continuing to grow up and make a name for himself in society. So basically, in this novel, he becomes obsessed with this aristocratic lady. He uses this connection that he has through his other friend to get to know her. He inserts himself in the social circle. So a lot of this book is taking place at dinner parties and social events. And then he kind of realizes by the end that these people are maybe more troublesome than he had initially believed. It's basically all about hype because, you know, in your minds you build up like celebrities or people that you don't know to be these kind of like epic figures and then you get to know them and you realize that someone is very different than their name or than their public persona and usually that is kind of a disillusioning process for a lot of people. So I knew going into the book that that was going to be kind of the story that we'd be following but it was still really clever and well crafted how he takes you through this journey from being just obsessed to being kind of disillusioned by the end and the ending in this was truly brutal when you really see kind of how callous and self-centered some of these people truly are. The ending definitely hit me hard and I love that with each of these volumes of Proust's novels they always do have this kind of good sucker punch ending that really makes you understand what kind of lessons he's learned in that text and it gets you excited to continue forward. So for my rankings for this book, for the enjoyability category I gave this four out of five stars 
Proust just makes me really happy when I'm reading him. I enjoy his language, so that's always fun for me. And I really do like his social commentary and these kind of sharp observations that he makes about people. I did knock off a star because sometimes some of the scenes do feel like they go on a little bit long. There are some like really long hundred plus page dinner party scenes. Of course not all of the conversations that he's listening to or observations are really all that memorable so it can get a little bit tedious um, so I did knock off a star for that but overall I thought this was a lot of fun to read. For my second category of endurance, I gave this book a three out of five. I gave it a little bit of credit. Um, it is kind of difficult to get through Proust's long sentences sometimes. And like I said, there's not really a lot of plot and you are following these long observations of social situations. So that can be kind of hard on your stamina and endurance if you're getting kind of tired of these silly aristocratic characters. But overall, there's nothing in this book that really felt truly challenging that was going to keep me from finishing it. This was one that I was just reading slow and steady throughout the whole month. I was trying to just get to like 25 pages a day. So there was really like no challenge with this one or like real fear that I wasn't going to finish by the end of the month. And for the last category of longevity, I gave this one of four out of five stars. So this is partly taking into consideration the whole scope of the project of In Search of Lost Time because this is definitely this like monumental huge reading project that I'm undergoing and this was a very satisfying installation of that. I felt like we had a really good growth with the character and the social world is becoming so much more complex, especially as he's starting to get older. His relationships are changing with people that we've met from the earlier books and I love watching that development happen. Um, I also, like I mentioned, really enjoyed learning about class structures in France at the time and I feel like it's also starting to get into some more political issues um, that he wouldn't have been as concerned with when he was a younger narrator. So for example, uh, there's a lot of content in here about the Dreyfus affair and how different characters are responding to that. So I do feel like I learned a lot. I'm understanding France at this time period uh, much better. But I did knock off one star for this because this would probably be my least favorite volume that I've read out of the first three for In Search of Lost Time. There's nothing really inherently wrong with this one. It just didn't strike that deeper emotional connection with me. Whereas I feel like the first two volumes of the series, I was kind of like furiously underlining these passages because they resonated so strongly with me. And I just felt more um, for the stories and the characters and the things that were happening. So this one didn't quite get me in that way. For the next three mammoths that I have to show you, these are all books that I actually ended up finishing on the same day, which also happened to be March 31st, the final day of the readathon. So I did leave things a little bit down to the wire. But anyway, these were mammoths that, for the most part, I had been reading throughout the whole month. So let's start off with my nonfiction mammoth of the month. And that was the novel A Biography by Michael Schmidt. Now, this is truly a hefty mammoth. This is 1,106 pages, and it is all devoted to the topic of the novel. So it is kind of tracking the development of the novel in English from its strange origins, kind of coming up as this like mashup from all these other different forms of texts, now to its modern day developments. And this ended up being such a rewarding reading experience for me. I mentioned in my TBR video that I'm actually not an English major. So I went to school for music and I did minor in English, but I really only got to take a handful of classes. So I'm always feeling like there are so many gaps in my literary education and I feel like I've been spending all of my time since finishing school trying to make up for those gaps and to read the classics that I never had to read in school. So that's definitely been keeping me busy. But this novel was so helpful because basically each chapter felt like its own kind of lecture on a certain period of history, a certain genre, a certain author, or some key novels that could be grouped together in style. So I will show you. I did treat this pretty seriously, like it was education. <laughs> um, this is my handy dandy notebook that I keep. Um, as you can see, it's pretty big, uh, the pages, and I think I got like 40 something 
pages of notes from this book. So I feel like every chapter I at least had like a page of notes to work through. And it's been fun actually going back through these notes and highlighting the points that I thought were important and the titles that have really jumped out at me. There are a lot of classic books that I now feel like I'm obligated to read and quite a few contemporary ones as well. There are also books that I am less excited to read about now, but um, that's kind of part of the game, I guess. You do get to understand the author's taste. You start to know what his biases and prejudices are. It kind of got comical by the end, like he really hates Atonement by Ian McEwan. And I feel like any chance he could slip in a jab at Atonement's ending, he would take that. So definitely um, he was an author who is not afraid to air out uh, some of the things that he doesn't like the beats, for example. But overall, he just struck me as someone who is extremely well read and has such a rich respect for the literary tradition. He wasn't afraid to bust up the canon and to, you know, write off books that are commonly respected or to try to um, bring to your attention other books that maybe deserve more recognition. But I also really appreciated that Schmidt does not just try to rely on his own cult of personality uh, to guide you through all of these literary works. It's really not about him, um, but he brings in lots of other voices. So he calls these people artist practitioners. So these famous, well-loved authors who were also very passionate readers. So anytime you'd be talking about a classic text, you would usually get some very interesting, juicy content about how other authors responded to it and whether they loved it or they hated it. And usually with any classic work, the response would be love or hate. And I think that that was so cool to see. And you could really start to understand um, why these authors were drawn to certain types of literature and what they took away from those themes and applied into their own works. It was really cool. You could map out this big web of connections between all of these authors. So that was really fun. And it kept the book always entertaining because authors are just so catty and they say the cruelest things about each other but I was here for the drama. So for my first category of enjoyability, I would have to give the novel a biography four out of five stars. This is highly enjoyable. Like I said, it was kind of like taking a university level class on the history of the English novel, but it was never dry. Like this does not read like a textbook where he's just hurling information at you. Like I mentioned, he's always bringing in other voices, all these controversial opinions. I laughed so many times while I was reading this. So it was really engaging. So for that reason, um, this was quite an enjoyable read. For my second category of endurance, I gave this book four out of five stars, <laughs> mainly because it is just very long and lengthy and it was very time consuming. So it would take a big chunk of my day and my reading time uh, to get through my quotas of this book every day, especially because I was also like writing down my notes. <laughs> so um, it was one endurance wise, you were just taking in so much content, right? Like every chapter you're taking in this whole historical era, um, this whole genre, this big author, their biography, um, their famous works, uh, their critical reactions. So it was just a lot of content. So that could be kind of difficult to process and get through. I also felt like this book lost a little bit of steam as we went to kind of the final few chapters of it. Once we got to the 20th century, it was harder for the author to go through things chronologically. So he was trying to go thematically, but I found that he was trying to just shove too many authors into each chapter. So it could feel kind of hard to stay focused. And it just felt with some chapters that certain authors were kind of shoehorned in uh, that maybe didn't need to be there. So I would have liked that section to have been a little bit more condensed. I think that would have made the reading experience a little bit easier um, to not have just like so many names thrown at you. So that's why I gave it a four for endurance. Definitely took some stamina and discipline to get through reading the whole thing within a month, but it was just too enjoyable to truly be a five-star endurance kind of read. And then for the final category of longevity, I gave this book five out of five stars because I learned so much from this. I have taken away so many thoughts and ideas that I'm now applying to the books that I'm reading now. So that is something that is truly worthwhile in my opinion. Like I just have so much of a better idea about context and the literary tradition. And I also have a super long list of books that I now need to track down and read. So thanks for destroying my TBR, Michael Schmidt. But that's really what I wanted out of this book. So I got everything that I wanted. It was fun. 
I learned so much. This book is awesome. So if you ever do come across this one, I highly recommend checking it out. If you are a literature language kind of nerd, I think that you'd take away a lot from this book. Next up, we have the oldest mammoth on our list, and that is The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, and this is the translation by Wayne A. Rebhorn. So I have to shout out this translation. Um, this is a hella old text, you know, from the medieval period, and he made it feel very accessible and very easy to read. So that is always kind of like strange. Like, I feel like this should be harder. I feel like I shouldn't understand these stories as well as I do. But um, the translator definitely did a great job of bringing them up to present day language to make them feel very accessible and very just easy to understand. So this was one uh, that I picked up midway through the month. Uh, this was not planned on my TBR, but like I said, I found out I would be spending some more time at home, so I decided to throw it on there. The Decameron is set over the span of 10 days, and it's about a group of young people who are leaving the city of Florence because it has been struck by the plague and has been completely devastated. So the entire social order has collapsed, and these people are scared, and they don't know what to do, so they decide to just take their servants and just go off into the woods and just be jolly together for 10 days. And they just want to kind of like dance and tell each other stories. So each day of the Decameron is a different member of the group being chosen as king or queen, and they are leading the other members through the stories that they're going to be telling. There's usually a certain theme or a topic that they're exploring each day. So I kind of liked the structure of that. Like you always knew exactly what you'd be going into with each day. It was definitely weird reading about the plague content now in the context of the world going through this COVID-19 crisis. So that felt a little bit strange and a little bit relatable, but really these guys were all just trying to take their minds off of the troubles through their stories. And I found that I was kind of in a similar boat, you know, because I too needed to like ease up, have a break from the news and just read some like really weird medieval tales because a lot of these tales were definitely on the strange side, uh, which I enjoyed. Like I found them ridiculous a lot of the time, but usually they were very entertaining. So for this book's rankings, um, for enjoyability, I gave it a four out of five stars. So part of that was definitely the translation, just making it feel very easy and approachable. And part of that was just the stories themselves. Like these are just classic tales. You know, there's a reason that they have been passed down through the centuries. And it was amazing how relatable so many of these stories still felt. However, there are of course some things from the medieval period that do jump out at the modern reader, like the blatant sexism and misogyny that's going on. You know, stories about husbands that are beating their wives and they're kind of played for jokes. Or like the female characters will respond to punishments that women go through and being like, yeah, she deserved it. She didn't have virtue. So that stuff was weird for a modern reader. But still, there were still just a lot of stories in here that you could still definitely get a kick out of <laughs> with uh, a modern perspective. Because, you know, there's lots of stories that are railing against corruption, particularly with the clergy in this context, um, or people who are trying to deceive each other or play tricks on one another. A lot of these were pretty fun, and a few of them even had me laughing out loud, which I was not expecting. So I did quite enjoy the tales that were found in here. I did take a little bit of enjoyment off from my rating because they could feel a little bit repetitive, because every day you have 10 stories on the same topic. So sometimes the stories didn't feel so fresh, especially um, when I was getting near the end after having read 100 of these kind of stories, I was ready to be finished and done with the Decameron. Uh, for the second category of endurance, I gave this one a two star because there was nothing particularly difficult or challenging with reading this book. It's actually really easy to get through for a mammoth since it's basically just a short story collection. So it's not really like you have to go through this long, dense, difficult plot. I mean, there's not much of a story to follow and each of the stories are all pretty short on their own. There were hardly any that were longer than 20 pages. So nothing in here felt very difficult endurance wise. And then for my final category of longevity, I gave this one a three star rating. So again, this is like another 
classic work of literature that I'm really glad to have under my belt. I enjoyed it more than I was expecting to, so that was definitely a bonus. I was worried that these tales would have lost all of their sense of humor. It responds a lot to other works of Italian literature, particularly Dante's Divine Comedy, so I liked seeing how this one kind of played off of Dante as this kind of great spiritual work, where this is more this compendium of earthly values. So it was kind of cool that it was like trying to be epic in scope like Dante, but it was more about just like being a human and the pleasures that we have and the physical sensations of having a body. So that was kind of cool. However, I did take off some stars for longevity for this one because, you know, when you do compare it to something like Dante that is like truly great and truly mind-blowing, this isn't really that, <laughs> but it's not trying to be. So, you know, that's okay. You've got to love it for what it is. And also there are a lot of stories in here that aren't particularly memorable. Although there are a few that I will just never forget for as long as I live. <laughs> so yeah, this was definitely ridiculous, but it was also a lot of fun. And then the last mammoth that I finished in the month of March was Fathers and Crows by William T. Volman. This book is 870 pages of text and then it is also an additional 120 pages of glossaries and endnotes. And I really do recommend reading the endnotes if you are ever checking out a William Volman Seven Dreams novel because they are just very thorough and they give you a much larger appreciation for what Volman is doing with this project and how much extensive scholarship and research is going into these fictional books because he is taking you through um, the sources and he also has funny quotes in here um, from historians who are maybe disagreeing with his work and it's him being like eh, I don't care I changed this detail if you don't like it you can write your own book. So there were some fun sassy comments in the end notes that made them worth my time. So Fathers and Crows, wow, was this ever an epic reading experience. William T. Volman has been working on the Seven Dreams project since the 90s and basically each book is taking on a different kind of colonial encounter between the indigenous people of North America or Turtle Island and with some kind of invasive European colonial group. So for the first novel in the series we got to deal with the Vikings and in this one we are dealing with the French. So we've got the French business people and colonizers that are trying to explore what will become Canada and to set up some settlements there. And as well, in order for them to be getting their funding and their protection from the French king, they also need to be doing conversions and to be making Canada this Christian space. So that's why we are spending a lot of time with French Jesuit missionaries. And many of the characters that appear in this story are based on true historical figures. You do know going into this book that you are going to be reading about their martyrdom. So this book is taking on some of the wars that were happening between different First Nations groups, uh, particularly in this story we are dealing with a clash between the Iroquois Haudenosaunee Confederacy with the Huron people. And the Jesuit missionaries that were working with the Huron did not meet a happy ending. So it's kind of the weird thing with this book is that you know what it's building up to. It is building up to this big act of violence. But it was kind of weird because you're not really excited for that. You don't really want anyone to die in a particularly spectacular, brutal kind of fashion. So you didn't really have that sort of momentum of excitement pushing you through the book. It was more just like dread. So it just kind of steadily becomes more violent and more tense as the novel continues. So this is definitely not a feel-good read, but colonialism is not a feel-good subject. I feel like Volman is just great at capturing the complexity of what is happening with these relationships. So I feel like this book was really able to make history come to life and it's not about liking the characters or not, it's kind of just about understanding where they're coming from because these are just people who don't understand each other. 
they have cultures that are not at all compatible. So he makes you understand the First Nations people and why they were willing to engage in these trade relationships with Europeans. He makes you understand the French colonizers and what they were doing, risking their lives, trying to set up these new communities in New France. And he also makes you understand the Jesuit missionaries, and they are not easy guys <laughs> to understand, but he works you through the philosophy of the movement. He takes you through a brief biography of Saint Ignatius of Loyola, so you understand like their foundation and the kind of bravery that it took for them to leave behind all of their comforts in life to go to these completely unknown territories where their safety was like severely jeopardized. They were not in safe situations, but they felt so dedicated to their cause, they really felt like they were saving souls and doing the right kind of thing. So you just have all of these completely clashing perspectives and watching them all kind of come together in this text was really incredible. I noticed when I was reading this that some of the material was feeling kind of familiar and that was when I realized that I had actually read a version of this story uh, that was told by Joseph Boyden in his novel The Arenda. The Arenda is a book that achieved a huge amount of literary and commercial success in Canada and I realized after reading Fathers and Crows that this is a much more simplistic retelling of this kind of tale. Like, it just made me see how straightforward this book is. Um, Fathers and Crows takes the same kind of history, but it's just so much more complex. It's so much denser. So I can kind of see the average reader probably doesn't want to battle their way through hundreds of years of history. Um, they might like the more condensed, streamlined story that Boyden offers here, but I couldn't help but feel like this just paled in comparison. So if you read The Arenda and are looking for something that is like more challenging and more in depth, you should definitely go into Fathers and Crows. Now, in terms of reading this book, for my first category of enjoyment, I would give this one a three out of five stars because like I mentioned, there's a lot of violence, which is not the best thing to read about for me. I don't really consider that fun. Um, and also it is just kind of dense and it's difficult. There's a lot of history that's getting thrown at you. So it's not really a text that you're going into and like having a barrel of laughs. So it did lose some points for enjoyability. For my second category of endurance, I did give this one five stars. It was a tough read. Um, it did take a lot of my stamina to finish this one, and it took me the entire month to read, even though I had started it right at the beginning of the month. But I found that I had read about 100 pages or so in like starts and stops, and I had to go back and read those first 100 pages again. <laughs> so this is definitely a book that like you need to give it your serious attention and your focus, or you're going to miss some details that are going to be pretty important later on down the line. So this took a lot of endurance. This book is structured um, through this metaphor of this stream of time. So the narrator is always referring to this river of time um, that he uses to jump back and forth between these different periods. We see Montreal in the present day, and then obviously the stuff that's happening more in the colonial era. So it can be a bit confusing figuring out what's happening with the time jumps. Definitely took some endurance to finish this one. So I gave it a full five stars on that front. And for our final category of longevity, I also gave this one five out of five stars because this was just such a memorable read for me. It really has challenged my own beliefs and understanding about Canada's past and like Canada's future. I love when non-Canadian writers try to understand Canada because I feel like they truly understand how complex we are as a country, like especially when you're throwing Quebec into the mix, right? There are just so many different cultures and intersections and beliefs at the heart of this project that we're calling Canada. And I love when outsiders are noticing that because to a lot of Canadians, we just kind of accept our reality and we don't challenge it enough. So it's really cool to see someone else's perspective. So I really took a lot of value from the experience of looking at this period of Canadian history in much greater detail. I learned a lot. It made me reconsider a lot of my own notions that I had about history and present day culture. So this book was very monumental and I'm so excited to be reading this series. It's challenging, it's rewarding, and it's really an exciting literary project. So now that we've talked about all of the books, let's return back to my mammoth ranking points so that we can see the scores in context and see which ones ended up being my favorites. So to start from least favorite to favorite, 
the book with the least amount of points was Boccaccio's The Decameron, which got nine points, so still a very enjoyable read. It was just kind of a lot more ridiculous than the other ones that I read. Coming in next with ten points is The Count of Monte Cristo, truly an epic adventurous revenge tale, just not one that really hit me on that deeper emotional level. Next, with 11 points, is The Guermant Way by Marcel Proust, another glittering, fabulous installation in the In Search of Lost Time series, just not my favorite volume that I've read so far. And then for first place, we actually have a tie. So there were two books that both scored 13 points, and I'm glad that they got the same score because it's really impossible to pick a favorite out of these two because they were both wonderful and they were super valuable for me on a personal level, but for like very different reasons. So of course, those two are the novel, a biography, and Fathers and Crows by William T. Volman. Both of them are pretty dense and challenging mammoths, but they are just... <laughs> so rewarding and they will really make you think a lot, which is everything that I look for in a good mammoth. So I'm excited to say that these were my best two mammoths of the month. So that is it for my March wrap up. I didn't read anything else aside from mega long books, which is something that I am going to be changing in April because man, do I miss like graphic novels and plays and short stories, all of those things. So I'm really excited in April to just go back to my regular routine of reading whatever the heck I want, whenever the heck I feel like it. But I am still really glad that I committed very seriously to March of the Mammoths. I always feel like it is one of my most rewarding reading months and it is the month that just challenges me the most as a reader. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm always trying to grow and get better. And I feel like this month is great to push me in that kind of regard. So really glad that I co-hosted and participated in March of the Mammoths this year. I know that there were a lot of you wonderful people who were also reading some long books. So if you have finished your Mammoths, please let me know. If you haven't finished, no big deal. You've at least probably made a good dent, which is progress, which is something. So let me know if you were doing this challenge and how it went for you. If you weren't reading Mammoths in March, you can also tell me about what you're reading because I still like to hear about that anyway. So thanks so much for checking out this video. I I will see you again soon. Take care. Bye.